look at internships that provide like a variety of different experiences and locations, just because you might not really know what work environment you enjoy, and it gives you more time to network with different preceptors and um, learn about possible new job opportunities. Do you ever have so many questions and no one to ask, so they're just wasting away on Google searches you'll forget about in an hour or so? We had that same problem, and that's why we created the rd to be podcast, a resource for dietetic and nutrition students looking for answers that their peers don't have. We are students Macy and Emily and registered dietitian Carl Barnes. We engage in conversations and learn from RDs. Join us weekly as we gain insight into the unique journeys of registered dietitians all over the country. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the RD2B podcast. I'm your registered dietitian host, Carl Barnes. Every week we sit down with a different registered dietitian uh, to really give you the perspective uh, from a practicing dietitian, what they do and their their feedback and advice to you as a student on your path to becoming a dietitian. Uh, we really like to highlight the diversity of the profession and just how broad the opportunities are out there of what you can do in this field. And just because you've chosen one path doesn't mean you're set on that. You can always pivot and lots of opportunity ahead. Uh, so this week we are sitting down with Dr. Monica Went. She's a lecturer at uh, the University of Maryland, and um, super honored to have someone. We haven't had someone from academia in a while, so um, thanks so much for being here. I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, like Carl said, my name is Monica Went. I've been an RD for almost 20 years, and I'm currently a lecturer at University of Maryland in the Nutrition and Food Science Department. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to uh, talk to you today. Awesome. Thank you. I'm again, I'm Emily, your RD to be from University of Maryland, and I'm so happy to be able to interview one of my professors. So, Dr. Wen, um, what made you want to go to University of California Davis for your undergrad? Well, I grew up in California, so mm -hmm. it was an easy choice to go to a public school in California. When I started out, I didn't actually know I was going to major in dietetics, so I just chose UC Davis because of the location and some friends of mine were going. Um, but luckily, once I was there in my freshman year, I decided that I wanted to go into the dietetics major, and they actually had that major there, so I was very fortunate about that. Were there any specific events that made you want to become a dietetic major, or did it just happen to like fall in line? I had been involved in sports in high school, and so I was interested in healthy eating at that time. And then um, after I got into college, I realized that that was something I was actually really interested in and realized that, you know, dietetics was a career. So I just researched it a little and then decided I would go into that. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I too was like really interested in um, sports and high school and like that's kind of why I decided to do dietetics as well so that's awesome um so what activities or extracurriculars did you do at UC Davis that made you more competitive when you started to apply for your internship well our dietetics department offered some student internships that you could sign up for every quarter so through them, I was able to sign up for some volunteer experiences, and that included working at a community meals service, so that helped me get some food service activities. And then we also had one where I volunteered at WIC, the Women, Infant, Children program, so I worked with a lactation consultant there and observed how she did her job. And another was shadowing a dietitian in a hospital. So I was lucky that the school provided some of those internships that we could actually sign up for. I didn't have to search it out for myself. So when you were applying for internships, do you mind sharing what um, internships you did apply for and then how you decided upon going to Georgia for your internship? Sure. Well, they still had the matching process back then. So we just had to match uh, where they where we were matched to, didn't have too much choice after I applied, but um, I applied to five different places across the United States. I didn't have the highest GPA due to having difficult science courses in my, you know, freshman and sophomore years, so I didn't feel like I would be that competitive, 
I applied to one place, Fresno State in California. I applied, I think, to West Virginia University. I applied to, a, I can't even remember like specifically, but a couple other places that may have been um, in the Midwest. So, and in the one in Georgia. And the main way I chose where to apply was I was kind of looking at the cost and also what GPA they said they would accept. And then also the place in Georgia that I ended up getting accepted to, accepted 16 interns. So that gives you a better chance of being accepted when they have a higher number of interns. So um, that was mainly the reasons that I was looking at. And I figured even though I would have to move to go to an internship, it's only for the one year or less. So then you can you know, leave and go to the location that you want to. So would you recommend for students that have a lower GPA to apply to a higher um, number? Let me reword that. So for students that have a lower GPA, would you suggest that they should apply to programs that have like a higher number of students they accept? Or how do you, like what kind of advice do you have for that? Yeah, I mean, that would make sense. I mean, of course, you never know if you have a lot of different unique things about yourself that might make you more of an attractive applicant. Um, but yes, I think that you will have more success in places that may accept a larger number of interns. Um, also, from where I was going in California, the school told us that we might have more success in the southeast of the United States. So uh, because like a lot of people want to apply to California, but not everyone wants to apply to some of those locations in the Southeast. So it might help you be more competitive in those locations. So if you're just looking to get accepted, you can you know, try to be more broad about where you apply. So I noticed that after your internship, you were a clinical dietitian for the Air Force. So how did that come about and what did that look like? Well, yes, I never would have thought that I would have done that even during my undergraduate years. Um, when I was actually in my internship, it wasn't, of course, through the Air Force, but one of our rotations was in an Army hospital. So the Army dietitians would you know, take us around and help us um, to do some of our clinical duties. So I actually enjoyed working there with the Army dietitians, and I thought that they had like a really unique job. And compared to like some of the civilian hospitals, I found they had like a lot more like responsibility and independence uh, working in their clinical rotation. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Later on, some Air Force recruiters actually talked to our internship. So I didn't want to do it right away, but I later on was looking for jobs and didn't find a lot that I really wanted to do when I went back to California. So I ended up just taking a chance and I applied and then I ended up getting accepted to the Air Force. So with that, you become, once you ha already have a bachelor's degree, you become what they call a commissioned officer, but you go in specifically to do dietetics, of course. So when I, um, my main role there was a clinical dietitian, and I primarily worked in the medical centers on the base. So that's where the military members and retirees can go to get medical care. Um, I worked both in inpatient because they do have an inpatient hospital, but they also have like outpatient counseling. So in the same day, I might see inpatients and outpatients. So you just kind of have to divide up your time. Um, and then also you work with sometimes like the food service personnel. So you have to supervise some of the people who work in the food service. So there are a lot of responsibilities and really you don't really get to specialize. So it was a good opportunity to do lots of different things like see people in the ICU and see people in a dialysis unit and see people like in a cancer care treatment area. So you get a lot of different experiences. Was any area like more interesting to you than others when you were going through um, those rotations? Um, that's a good question. I, I mean, for me, I'm really more of a clinical person. So I liked the ICU and nutrition support probably the best. Awesome. So I also noticed that you um, worked as a program specialist for the USDA. So how did um, you get into that. What did you do for them? And like, how did it differ from the Air Force? <laughs> Obviously, it's very different. 
Um, I ended up going to graduate school. I mean, although I liked um, some aspects of clinical, I kind of got a little burned out in seeing clients at the time. So I just decided I'm going to try to do a little something different. And I went back to school to get a master's and I decided I was going to go into food science because I felt like I already had a pretty good background in nutrition. I didn't want to like continue doing studying that. I felt like I knew a lot already. So I decided to major in food science for a master's and I ended up staying at University of Maryland and um, continued to a PhD. So I spent a lot of years doing that. Then um, the job at the USDA, I just kind of applied to different um, government positions in different areas. I ended up getting offered that position. It was in um, National Institute for Food and Agriculture, which provides research grants to universities mainly, um, and they sort of provide funding for research from the USDA. And my role was in the division of nutrition and food science. So basically having the other extra degree in food science helped me to be accepted to that position. Um, so mainly what we did there is help to process research proposals and help to provide funding for university research. So you get to see a view of what different researchers are working on at agricultural universities across the country. So since you were able to see what other researchers are doing, did that help you during your PhD at all? Like, did you, did you have to do any research during your PhD or what did that look like for you? Um, yes, in my PhD, I did actually start at the USDA job after I already basically finished. Oh, the oh, 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 okay. It wasn't like it helped me a lot, but um, I did do research at, in the PhD and I studied food chemistry and food science mainly, but focused on nutraceuticals and functional foods, which means like the specific phytochemicals and vitamins and nutrients that are within foods and mainly studied like plant-based foods like whole wheat products and different um, agricultural products. So I actually didn't know a lot about it, at least doing lab work when I started. So that was a lot of training that I had to do. Um, we ended up having to work in like the food chemistry lab and learning some of the chemistry techniques. So that was a whole different, obviously, experience than I had had uh, as a clinical dietitian, which I found it really interesting, but I ended up realizing I don't really like working with chemicals all the time. So I'd rather do more like research that doesn't involve being within the lab. So what other research um, have you done or are you participating in now? Um, I don't do a lot of research in my current job because it's mainly the job description I have as lecturer. So I mainly um, you know, do teaching and I was hired for teaching, but sometimes I still work with uh, my former graduate school advisor, which is Dr. Lucy Yu, and she runs the Nutraceutical and Functional Foods Lab. So sometimes I work with her and her graduate students and help to like advise them on some of the research that they're doing and um, work with them on their thesis projects. So I don't really do a lot of my own research right now, but sometimes help with others. So going back to um, the USDA, were there any research projects in particular that you found really interesting? Um, at the time, that's a good question. I was working mostly in the food safety division. So people were working on um, like antibiotic resistance and uh, that at the time, that's the main thing I remember. At, right now, I don't remember a lot of the details and we're not even supposed to talk about like the details because they were people's, you know, projects that hadn't yet been funded. So, but it was mainly a lot of like food safety and how agriculture can breed antibiotic resistance. That's really interesting. When I think of research, I think more of like what you did your research on, not necessarily like how to make it safer, like safety in general. Um, so knowing that you did your PhD at University of Maryland, as well as your master's, what made you want to become a professor at University of Maryland and stay there? Well, that's also something I didn't really intend to do. Um, 
it just sort of happened because I, after I worked at the USDA for a while, I actually had two small kids. So I didn't want to work full time at that time. So I ended up taking time out just to uh, be a stay at home parent with them. So after I had done that for a couple of years, I, the university contacted me and just said, oh, we need someone to teach a class. Can you do it? So I said, okay, sure. That sounds like a good opportunity to start going back to work. So I taught nutrition in the life cycle, but I was just a part-time instructor for that class. So after I did that for a couple semesters, they said, well, we need you to teach more classes. So if you want, you can be hired as a full-time instructor. So then um, I said, yeah, sure, that will work out for me. So I ended up taking on that job where I teach two or three courses per semester, plus advise the undergraduate students and work on some other items for our department. So I didn't really plan it, but it turned out to be a good option for me at this time. So what was, what's your favorite class that you teach? Um, I would say, I mean, all of them have some interesting things and good benefits about them. I think one favorite is life cycle nutrition, just because in that class you can talk about the nutrition needs for pregnancy and infants. And I think the students kind of like that and get excited about it. And um, I just think it's a interesting part of nutrition. And I think it's helpful for students, even if they don't use it in their career, hopefully they'll remember something later in life, maybe if they become parents. So um, that's why I like that class. Yeah, I, that was my favorite because, you know, that's the third course we get into. We do 100, 112, and then 315, and that kind of made me want to work with either the geriatric or the pediatric population. I don't really care about the middle people. They can take care of them. <laughs> but, like, I really, like, that class really made me interested in the different sides of the spectrum and, like, taking care of them nutritionally, whether that's going to be, like, long-term care or, like, a NICU or a PQ or something like that. So I love that class. Um, and then were all of your courses that you teach assigned to you, or were you able to choose, or how did that look? Um, right now, most of them are assigned. Basically, the department already has them and needs them to meet requirements, but um, like medical nutrition therapy one, I kind of des designed it because we only had the second semester for students to take it. And a lot of students said they didn't really have enough time to learn everything. So we decided to add an extra semester. So that's something that I sort of started. And I mean, if I want to, I can always like propose a topic and think of new courses to teach. It just depends on how much time there is to do that. So what other courses do you teach besides for medical nutrition therapy one and nutrition and life cycle? Um, right now I teach um, what NFSC 220, which um, is called diet is it a cause or solution. And um, Dr. Song actually created that course, but it's more of like a lower level general education to help students learn about some of the controversies in nutrition and food science. So a lot of students seem to like that. Um, I also teach NFSC 491, which is our dietetics like final course. So they kind of just learn professional, it's, it's professional issues and opportunities in dietetics. So sort of just to even out everything they've learned. And I also ask a lot of dietitians to come and be guest speakers so the students can learn about those different careers. That's great. So if you were to design a class and in, in like addition to medical nutrition therapy one to help students get that transition from MNT one to MNT two, what other course would you be interested in potentially like teaching students or co-teaching with someone else? Um, probably what we can add on is something about like practicing nutrition counseling and maybe work with like psychologists or counselors who can also help people add some more psychological skills to that because that's something we don't do a lot of at least in our undergraduate program. So I know that you weren't you know when you were younger thinking that you wanted to be a professor and that you were just offered that opportunity and then it excelled from there, but what advice would you have for students who are interested in becoming a professor? 
Well, there are a lot of different ways that you can get into that. I mean, you can have like, for example, just a master's degree in nutrition um, and a lot of places can accept you like a community college or even a four-year college may let you just be an instructor if you just have a master's degree. So if someone wanted to pursue that like as a part-time position, that probably isn't that difficult to find. Um, but if you're interested in doing research, then it can be important to get a PhD. Um, but it's not as difficult a process as some people might think. I mean, you do have to find like a professor that might accept you to help you do your research. Um, but a lot of times, if you go to like a graduate school like University of Maryland, they will usually fund your um, graduate school tuition and give you a stipend if you work as a teaching or research assistant. So um, people think often like, oh, it will take so much time or money. It does take time, but you can get funding if you want to go to graduate school. Um, and if you want to do that, it is a pretty flexible career and you can be creative and keep learning throughout your life because you're constantly doing research or learning new things for teaching. So if people are interested in it, it is a definitely an interesting career path. So what are the different, I don't want to say tiers, but I know you're a professor, so that means you don't, or a lecturer, so you don't do research, but what would it be called if you were doing research and a professor at the same time, or are they still considered a lecturer? That is a good question. A lot of people may not know the differences. Um, yeah, so like in my position, I mainly hired to be a teacher, so they call it a lecturer. Although if I want to, I could do some research in my free time on the side, but it's not like a requirement. Um, uh, if you're hired like in the main, like what they call tenure track, then you are supposed to do research and teach. And that's usually called an assistant professor. Um, and then if you stay a long time and get tenure, you're called an associate professor. And then if you are even there longer, it's just called regular professor. So although people call me professor, sometimes I'm not like the title is that my job is not really professor. Yeah, I mean, I know I definitely called you professor I went, whoops. Um, I mean, it's so, okay, because it seems weird to call me doctor as well. So <laughs> yeah, know. and like, I know that some people um, like going through the University of Maryland in specific, they're like, just don't call me doctor, don't call me, just call me my first name. And it's like, in high school, I called my teacher, Mr. or Mrs. Doctor. It's yeah. so like that transition of like, I don't know what to call you, but I can't call you by your first name, because that just seems like a little bit weird. Um, but that was in, like, I appreciated that you were able to break down the difference between like the assistant, associate, professor, and then professor, and then lecture. I feel like, I mean, I, I sure as heck didn't know that. Um, so what advice would you have for students that are contemplating, I guess, my class of 2022 and then the class of 2023 who are on the fence about getting a master's? What, um, advice would you give to them? Because I know you had your master's and then went on to continue a PhD program. Um, how would you, I guess, advise them? Um, yes, I mean, this current class, you may or may not have the option or need to get a master's degree. So um, I would say that a lot of the internships now are going to transition into providing an option to get a master's or a combined master's. So um, I would probably look into those like to see if that would be a good fit because then you can get it out of the way. Even if you may not be required to do it, you might want to have it in the future. So um, that's mainly what I would say as far as whether or not to get the master's or don't let it discourage you, I guess, because um, it, if you take one of those opportunities, usually they are like maybe a combined program that can be done in like 18 months to two years. So it may not be as long as you think it will take. Yeah. So I also had one more, hold on. What advantages did having a master's or a PhD provide you, um, opposed to, I guess, peers of yours that have not taken the master's or PhD route? I think the main difference is if you 
um, want to get into specific jobs, then sometimes they do ask that the person have an RD and a master's. And those are not, mostly those are not like the clinical jobs, but I guess like sometimes public health jobs or just, I mean, maybe corporate jobs. So I think it maybe opens a few more opportunities just because sometimes people are looking more for someone with a master's for more of a higher level or management job. I think people who know they only want to do clinical or like private counseling, you really, the master's won't make a big difference unless you maybe want to get a master's in business or something to help you with, you know, starting a business. So, and for PhD, I mean, I probably wouldn't recommend it unless you really like research and want to keep doing that. I don't think it helps a lot professionally unless you want really a specific research job. Would you say that those who have PhDs are typically more in the academic route opposed to, um, I guess, higher up in certain like clinical jobs or how would you differentiate like wanting to get a PhD opposed to staying with a master's degree? Um, yes, I would say like almost most certainly the PhD people that I know or that are RDs and PhDs um, mostly are working in like research or university or they may work in government like NIH or the FDA or places like that. So it can help if you really want to get into a research position. But I don't think there are many people still in the clinical, just clinical that have PhD unless it's also like at NIH and they're doing like research along with clinical. Yeah, I feel like that does make more sense because I don't really know too many clinical or even community registered dietitians that have that PhD credential unless they also do some um, sort of teaching or research as well. So kind of going back to being a professor, not to get too personal, but does that like help with like your, your, I know you mentioned you have kids. So like does being a professor almost help being like a parent as well, because you're able to have the summers and the winter breaks as well, or not yeah. really? Yeah, no, I think it helps a lot. I mean, I, I think I actually have stayed at the position because it helps me um, have more time. Like when my kids are off in the summer, I know I have much more flexible time. And yeah, longer winter break. So that helps as well. Yeah, sorry if that was a little too personal, bring in your family and stuff. But I do know that like other professors have gone that route as well because they're like, or just teachers in general that mm -hmm. have um, young children or just children in general because they, like we have the summers to hang out with them. We have the winters, like we're pretty much following on their calendar almost. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not like you have to put them in daycare or something over the summer or find stuff to do with them. Um, so since you're an advisor, I guess this is my final question. What advice would you have to dietetic students as they approach internship time? Um, I would say they will want to look at internships that provide like a variety of different experiences and locations, just because you might not really know what work environment you enjoy, and it gives you more time to network with different preceptors and um, learn about possible new job opportunities. Um, also, apply to several different internships so that you have a better chance to find a match. And also, don't be too discouraged if you don't get your first choice for internship because I mean, to me, the main goal is to just get into the internship and complete it, and then you have your requirements done. And once you have the RD, then you can go off and branch out into what you actually really want to do. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking time out to talk to us. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in the fall. Yes. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Dr. Wayne. I'm really glad you kind of hit on that practical approach to applying because I can't tell you how how much it it seems so repetitive giving that advice to students but that is that is a game changer for so many people